Well, good morning, Macedonia friends. Coming for you on Monday morning, and I am going to do our last Wednesday night's Bible study. Come to find out, we had a little trouble with audio Wednesday night, and we're not able to get that out. And so if you're not able to join us live and in person, and you join us online, I want you to be caught up with everybody else. And so we're going to do what we did Wednesday night, which is Colossians 3, 5 through 11, so that you can uh, be up to date with everybody else, and we don't want to leave anybody hanging out in the dark. So in Colossians 3, 5 through 7, we're going to talk about things that we have to put off. Uh, remember, we the first two chapters of the book of Colossians dealt with Paul's theology. He lays his theology out to the Colossian church. This is who Christ is. This is who we are in Christ. This is what you need to believe. This is what you need to know. And then the second two chapters, chapters 3 and 4, get to applying that theology, because what good is theology if we don't apply it in our lives, right? And so Paul gets to some practical application, and in these verses we look at here today, he's going to be talking about things that we need to stop, things that we need to put off, things that if we are in Christ, we need to not do anymore. These are things the world does. These are things we did when we lived in the world, but these are things that we need to eliminate from our Christian lives. And so starting in chapter 3 and verse 5, it says that, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come, and in them you also once walked while you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. All right, well, you know, Christian life is a struggle. It's a struggle for us, and it's a struggle of now and not yet. We apply that term a lot of times to the end times. We say, well, we know that the uh, righteousness will win out. It just hasn't been seen or revealed here yet. We know we are living in the last times. We know we are living our eternal lives and once we give our life and heart to Christ. So now we are citizens of heaven, but we are not there yet. So there's a kind of a now and not yet thing with Christ. And, uh, and it applies to us dealing with the two natures we have to deal with. You know, we were sinful in the flesh at one time, apart from God, separated from him, uh, ruled by our own desires, and that's the old nature. And then we give our life and heart to Christ, and we're, at that point then, filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are led by the Spirit, but then there's this constant struggle. Our flesh wants to overcome the Spirit. We want to live in the Spirit. There's a day coming when the, we will be completely sanctified. We will be completely put off this flesh, but it's not here yet. And until that time, we struggle with this uh, conflict between our two natures, and that's at the heart of living the Christian life. And so Paul tells these Colossians then, you know, who have these, these Gentiles, these people who have come to Christ, here's what you need to do. You need to start doing, or rather you need to stop doing, first we'll talk about. And the one thing he says, you're going to have to put off some things. And the first thing you need to put off are these unholy mindsets that you have. And you look at verse 5 and read down through verse 7. It says, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. It is on account of these things the wrath of God will come, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Now, many of the Colossian Christians were recent converts from paganism. They had come out of the Greco-Roman society around them. Colossae is a city and the western part of what we would call Turkey today, back in the day it was called Asia Minor. Uh, it's a little east of Ephesus, and so it's up there in those hills. And so it's a very cosmopolitan society. It's the middle of the Greco-Roman uh, society. And this society was very licentious. 
Uh, it was very uh, freewheeling. We think we live in times where it's, oh my goodness, look, anything goes. But look, trust me, first century Roman Empire days uh, it was just as bad or worse than what we see in our entertainment culture today. In fact, if you look at the uh, uh, old Roman ruins, and, and you know, especially, if, say, Pompeii and Herculaneum, where Mount Vesuvius erupted and buried these two Roman cities, and we found the most extent and the most uh, well-preserved Roman ruins in any of these, and as they've uncovered these, what they've found are numerous brothels in through the city of Pompeii with all kinds of lewd frescoes drawn on the wall to let you know what kind of services were offered at these places. And so uh, it was considered to be, in Roman society, they didn't think anything. They're, they're very loose uh, moral standards. Now, it was considered accepted that the man would be going with prostitutes and would be going around in a licentious behavior. The woman was supposed to stay home and be pure and raise the family. That's just how it was. But this was a very licentious, a very sensual society. And we see Paul telling them, look, you've got to consider your earthly body dead to immorality and purity and all these things. One of the knocks against Paul was that people would say that he was a little too free and easy with this grace thing. That he invited these pagans to come to Christ and, you know, they came out of these licentious lifestyles and he just added grace onto them and said, you're okay. That's, you know, we know that's not what Paul did, but it was one of the accusations made against him that he was a little too free with that for the recent converts and he needed to stress the law and make sure that they behaved the way they should. But Paul would say, look, we are saved by grace. But once we are saved, it should make a difference in our life and the way we live. And we've got to put off this old pagan way of living. He says to put off immorality in my translation. You may be reading something else that says uh, fornication. It's a type of, you know, basically has to deal with going to prostitutes, you know, going around and just living free and easy with the sexual morals of the day. Uh, he talks about putting off impurity, and these can sound like they go together, and in some ways they do, but impurity really has more to do with uh, truth and integrity. Don't live in a way that, uh, you know, mean what you say, say what you mean, kind of deal. Be a man, be a woman, be a person of integrity. Be who you are all the way from on the outside, all the way to your inner core. And so Paul is saying, put off that immoral behavior, that chasing after the prostitutes, that physical pleasure. Put off putting on a false face for your neighbors. Don't do that anymore. He talks about desire here, putting off passion and evil desire. And it's this idea of strong desire that leads you into these things, that makes you want to lie to get to what you want to have. It makes you... Uh, you know, want to uh, satisfy your that strong desire by any means possible. And he goes on and talks about greed, which is covetousness. Tra uh, my translation says greed, yours may say covetousness. And if you notice, Paul proceeds from the outer to the inner here. He starts with immorality, that behavior we can see, that fornication. We know you can be observed walking down the street and going into the brothel. We know what you're, act, what you're after, but really what drives it is your internal being. These desires, these wants that come from a covetousness of wanting more, not being satisfied, not being content with what we have. And Paul does the same thing that Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount here. You may remember in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus said, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. You've heard it said, you shall not commit murder, but I'm telling you, if you hate your brother in your heart, you are guilty of murder. And Jesus did the same thing. There are outward manifestations of the sin that is lodged deep within our heart. The things that we harbor, the things that we think about, these unholy mindsets that drive us to do the unholy behaviors. And that's what Paul is saying we have to put off. Now, you know, you, you, are, you can be guilty of the sin just because you lack the opportunity or the boldness to actually commit the sin doesn't mean that you're not guilty of it if you harbor it in your heart, you think about it, and you would like to do it. Well, you know, that inner motivation is where we all struggle. How many of us look at our neighbor, look at our coworker, and we might say nice things, but we don't feel nice things toward them. We know in our heart we despise them. 
We know in our heart we covet what they had. We want their job. We want their promotion. We look at our neighbors. We look at our family members, and we think they've got more than me. I should have that. But, you know, on the outside, we may something say something right. But innerly, we are not motivated to love and respect them. Well, this is what Paul is saying we've got to put off. We have to put off these unholy mindsets because they lead us into the unholy behavior that does not honor Christ in our lives. And so this is hard. This is where we all fail. You know, we all have unholy feelings and unholy thoughts at times. But Paul is saying, let the Holy Spirit come to the depth of your being and put these things off. And, you know, there's something else we have to put off, too, if we're, when we are in Christ. Not just our unholy mindsets. We have to put that off, the way we think, the way we look at the world. We have to put off that pagan, that worldly way of looking so we can see things through God's eyes. And then that will help us to put off the toxic behaviors we're so often guilty of. Look at verse 8 and 9. He says, You also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed with a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. You know that speech reveals the nature of our relationships, doesn't it? The way we talk to each other reveals how we think about each other, how we feel about each other. How we are actually uh, thinking in that moment will come out in the words that we use. You know, startling warning is that Jesus told us we would be called to judgment for every idle word that we utter because they reveal the thoughts of our hearts. And so speech reveals to us the nature of the state of our relationships. And when you look at these words that Paul used in here, he says to put aside, he talks about anger and um, wrath. And you'd think these two things go together. Well, anger is a state of mind. Anger is, uh, you know, can be, you know, we're supposed to put it off, but what Paul's talking about here is unrighteous anger, unholy anger. We are to hold on, you know, this is the same Paul who would say, be angry and do not sin. Anger is just a state of mind, a an indignation at something, and it, it can have its rightful place. You can be angry at unrighteousness, angry at injustice, and we rightly should be. In fact, Jesus would display anger at times in his life. When you look in John chapter 11, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, there's a phrase in there where you know he looks around and everyone is weeping and everyone is crying and everyone is uh, just so wrapped up in the finality of death and, and what could have been with Lazarus. And it, and it says that, uh, basically the phrase says he snorted. And it's an idea, it's like an expression of anger. And he wasn't angry at the people, he was angry at the situation that had all these people bound. And so you see this example of being angry and yet not sinning. And we can do that. But Paul, but anger is a state of mind, and there again, we have to control that. Now, wrath, which seems to go with it, often comes out of anger, but wrath is that spirited nature. It needs to be controlled. It has to be controlled. You know, uh, wrath, if you might think about it, is something we have to keep under control. Uh, I think this is the one, the old... One of the old Greek philosophers, and I can't remember who it was, said that, that the word that Paul uses for wrath here, he said, this is like uh, your dog that barks at everything, whether before he's found out whether it's a friend or a foe, he just barks at everybody, you know. So that's kind of wrath, the flying off the handle, that spirit in nature we need to control. Paul says don't do that. It's damaging to our relationships. These things are toxic uh, to let your anger get the best of you. Uh, to let your wrath just pour out and, you know, say things. He talks about malice and slander, seeking another's harm. Uh, malice, of course, we know what it means to be malicious. It means to, you know, just be mean-spirited, to do something intentionally to harm another person. And slander, you're just doing that verbally. You're going around talking about them. Maybe they got the promotion that you wanted at work, and you go around kind of spreading rumors about them behind their back. Uh, maybe you've had someone do this to you. You know, you have been misunderstood in your motives and people whisper and talk about you all behind your back. If so, you know how toxic words can be and how damaging these behaviors can be. He talks about abusive and obscene speech. Now, he's not necessarily talking here about what we would think of as obscenities and 
uh, dirty words and, you know, dirty jokes and things like that, although that can be part of what he's talking about here. He's mostly talking about, you know, kind of the words that drive people apart, what we would call fighting words, absurd, abusive, abusive, fighting words. You can't call me that. You can't say that to me. You know the kind of things I'm talking about. And these are the kind of things, you know, when you think you read over in the book of James where James says, see how great a forest is set afire by such a tiny flame when he talks about no one can tame the tongue. These things get us in trouble. This toxic behavior uh, shows up in our speech and in our words and we use our language to drive people apart, to drive people a wedge between us and others. And these toxic behaviors wreck relationships and they impair the growth of the body of Christ. This is how the world works, y'all. The world works this way. As the body of Christ, we're supposed to operate by the golden rule. We know the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. Came from Jesus himself. And you know the world's version of the golden rule, right? Do unto others before they do unto you. So we're called to put off these toxic behaviors to be uniters, not dividers, to be those who would heal instead of harm. This is essential to living the Christian life. And Paul is telling these new Christians, you've got to live a new way of life. You've got to change your thinking. You've got to put off the thinking like the world puts off. You've got to be renewed to the depths of your being and into your heart. And then these toxic behaviors that come out of this unholy thinking will be able to to lay aside. And when we can do that, the body of Christ grows and shines and draws more people to it. How many people are put off from the body of Christ because of the toxic behavior of the individual members of it? Maybe we've been poor witnesses in our workplace. Maybe we've been poor witnesses and toxic in our homes. Maybe we've been toxic in the church with other people. These things hinder the growth of, us, of ourselves individually and of the body as a whole. And they have to be put off. And the last thing that we need to put off is we've got to put off these unholy mindsets, this way of thinking, uh, you know, that's me first, me, 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 I'm going to get my desires, uh, and then put off the, the toxic things that we do. We're just not going to be that divider. We're not going to be that separator anymore. I want to be a healer. I want to be a uniter. And when we do that, we're able to put off the relational barriers that so often divide us. And this really speaks to us in our society today. Look at verse 10 and 11. It says, He have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. If we are a Christian, we have given our heart and life to Christ. We are no longer in the image of Adam, our sinful father. We are now being conformed to the image of Christ, the second image. You know, in verse 10, he, he talks about uh, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. We are supposed to look like Jesus Christ. And so if that applies to me, it also applies to you and your neighbor and anyone else who is in Christ. So if I'm being conformed to Christ and you're being conformed to Christ and my neighbor down the road is being conformed to Christ, guess what? We are each and every one equal in Christ. Doesn't matter where you were born, doesn't matter what language you speak, doesn't matter where you grew up, what culture you're in, what social strata you occupy, if we are being conformed to the image of Christ, we are all to look like Christ, we are all to be like Christ, therefore we are all equal. This is where the saying comes from, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's true, we don't rank one ahead of another. Just because someone is wealthy, they are not a more important Christian than anyone else. Just because someone is educated, they are not more uh, respected or not supposed to be in their relationship with Christ than anyone else. Yes, we all have different roles. Yes, we have uh, different 
things that we have to do, different uh, roles that we play in society, in church, in our families, in our homes. But no one is above another, and no one is allowed to look down upon another. We are not to build relational barriers. See, the, 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 everyone is equal in Christ. And when you look at this, this is a pretty comprehensive list of some of the divisions that still haunt us today. Uh, when he says there, you know, goes through there in verse 11, he says, there is no distinction between Greek and Jew. Well, he's talking there about racial division. I mean, the, the Jews and the, the Greeks, the Gentiles, especially if you came from the Jewish mindset that Paul came from, you're supposed to keep strictly separate. Those are unclean people. We're not to come together. And in fact, this was a huge sticking point in the early church. Peter and Paul even had an argument about it. Can we even eat with these unclean Gentiles? And Paul saying, yes, you can. And Peter was still stuck for a while in that old mindset that said we have to maintain the division. But Paul says it doesn't matter. Somebody's Greek, somebody's Hebrew, it doesn't matter. We're all the same in Christ. There is no racial division. He talks about some circumcised and uncircumcised. There's religious division. And this goes, you know, in the days of Paul, the circumcised would be the Jewish believers, either ethnically who were born into the religion or those who had converted to Judaism and say, you know, we are Jews and you are not. We are the chosen one. You can't come in. This religious division, in fact, you could see this even in the temple precincts. They had separate courtyards. You know, there was a big courtyard in the temple that was the court of the Gentiles. Everyone could come in. And then there was the court of the women in it. Jewish men and women could come into that. And then the court of the men, the women couldn't come in. And at each one, there was a sign. You can't come by here. In fact, the court of the Gentiles, it said, if you come in here, it's on pain of your death you know, if you cross this line. So there was a very strict religious division that Paul said, it's got to, it goes in Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised, uncircumcised, whether you came out of paganism or uh, Judaism or whatever ism. In Christ, we are all the same. He talks about barbarian and Scythian. That's cultural divisions. These people who were raised in Paul's day in the Greco-Roman Empire, they considered themselves to be cultured people. And you can look and even today see some of the wonderful public projects they built, the theaters, the racetracks, the, the, the grand buildings and the, the aqueducts and all of the public works and the roads that are still there. And you get the idea this was a very cultured, very successful, uh, very high living society, but they looked down on those who weren't part of that society. And when they say barbarians, they're talking about people who are from outside and where that word barbarian comes from is the Greeks would make fun of these people who lived outside of that society. And they would basically say they, they talk like bar, bar, bar. They don't have the language. They don't speak Greek like all of us do. And bar, 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 they just blather. And that's where barbarians come from. And these are the people of those tribes who lived up in the woods, those Germanic tribes in the northern part of Europe and, you know, towards the steppes of Russia and some of these uncultured, uncouth people who dressed roughly and didn't, you know, know our ways and our uh, uh, our mores. And, and there was, Scythians were considered even the most uncouth of the uncouth, the hillbillies of the day. Uh, they were a very violent, warlike people. And in some places, the Roman Empire used them as uh, policemen or other soldiers. And they were usually, when you found them in Roman plays or Roman entertainment, they were art, uh, items of ridicule, making fun of them because of their rough speech and their rude ways. And Paul says, look, we don't look down on other people because of where they're from or how they were raised or the culture that they came from. Jesus Christ died for them all, and so we love them all, and they are all equal to us. He talks about slave and free, the big social division of his day. You had a huge slave class. You had some free people who had money. You could buy other people to do your work and to run your household, and that's just how it was back in that day. And Paul's radical thing is to tell people it doesn't matter. The slave is equal with the free. In fact, if you read the book of Philemon, you find him sending a runaway slave named Onesimus, who was a slave of the man named Philemon. Paul sending Onesimus back to Philemon to say, I'm sending him back to you, but not as a slave, as a brother. Christ. He is your equal and to treat him so. It doesn't mean you don't have different roles to play or different jobs to do, but
but it does mean that I am not better than you because my social strata is higher or a different place. In other words, in the early church then, if the slave was the most spirit-filled person in the congregation, he should be the one teaching. And then the freeman who was higher socially on the social scale should accept his teaching and respect what he's doing and, and appreciate what he can and treat them equally in that. Yes, it's hard to do sometimes. We find difficulty with this even today. Sometimes, you know, in our we want to draw these divisions. Hey, these people are not the same color as me. These people don't speak the same language as me. These people uh, don't run in the same social circles as me. Uh, therefore, I don't have to listen to what they say. I only listen to people who look like me, talk like me, went to the same school that I went to, you know, run in the same social circles. They can't afford the same things that I afford. That is wrong, y'all. That is completely wrong and is completely unchristian. Uh, and it's got to go. If you can't sit in a church Sunday school setting and listen to a spirit-filled teacher who happens to be the poorest person in the church, you need to reevaluate your relationship with Christ. Don't think just because you are blessed financially or socially or culturally that it means you are more blessed spiritually than some who are more disadvantaged. And that's difficult for us today, and that's exactly what Paul was saying uh, we had to put off. So these are some things that we are to avoid or stop doing altogether, put off if we are indeed dead to the flesh. If we are dead to the flesh and we don't live in the world anymore, we will not have an unholy mindset. We will not exhibit toxic behaviors and divide people, and we will not set up relational barriers that promotes a ranking in and between brothers and sisters in Christ. 